This is perhaps one of my favorite stories, especially considering in this day and age, public opinion of the media is at an all-time low. I always find it hilarious when the media gets upset about being pranked. And the most similar comparison I have to today's story is when Captain Jenks, who used to be a frequent caller of the Howard Stern Show, would prank call CNN during breaking news, and the network anchor had the audacity to get upset about it. Since the news is in the business of making money and getting the first scoop, sometimes fact-checking or vetting their sources falls by the wayside. As you can see here when comedian Bob Hope passed away in 2003, CNN interviewed who they thought was one of his former writers, and then hilarity ensued. On the phone with us is Gene Perre, comedy writer who wrote for Bob Hope for 40 years. Gene, thanks for joining us. Thank you. So he was a pretty, it's a, he was a pretty great guy to work for then if you're a comedy writer. It makes oh, you look good. He was the best. He was the, mm -hmm. the best boss one could ever have. And uh, from what I understand, he died choking on Howard Stern's ball sack. Amazing that even at times uh, like this, that when uh, the country is trying to mourn a great entertainer, that uh, people try to pick a very inappropriate time to try to be funny. So we'll just move on. But today we go back to 1992 when Seattle was in the media spotlight. Record labels and the news media descended on the city to cover the music scene and find out what made this part of America responsible for so many of the biggest bands at the time. MTV even sent reporter Tabitha Soren to the city in 1992 to cover the music scene. But according to the book Everybody Loves Our Town, Soren only wanted to meet and I quote, cute boys like Chris Cornell and was disgusted by the band Tad after seeing them live, despite the fact that Tad was an important part of the music scene. MTV even refused to play Tad's video for Wood Goblins because, and I quote, it was too ugly. It came as no surprise that soon enough people in Seattle became suspicious of the media. But one thing that may surprise you is that the media was already descending on Seattle long before Pearl Jam even broke big. Remember, their debut album 10 took almost half a year to take off. In an interview with Jenny Booty, a former publicist from Sub Pop in the same book, she would reveal every local paper would call up like they had some unique idea. Oh, I want to do a story on this hot topic, the Seattle scene. I tell them not to, that it's been done too much already. What a great publicist. Nobody wanted to talk about it anymore. That was before Pearl Jam hit, and it was already tiresome, she'd say. One of the local record labels, Sub Pop, was fielding a lot of inquiries from reporters across the country about the Seattle music scene. One reporter from the New York Times called the office one day requesting an interview, and one of the label's co-founders, Jonathan Poneman, was tired of talking to the press and referred the reporter to a former employee named Megan Jasper, who had just lost her job at the label as a receptionist. At the time, Jasper was working from home for a different label, Caroline Records, as a sales rep. Jasper would remember drinking nearly an entire pot of coffee before the interview and revealed she had a good buzz going according to the website ringer.com. The interview with the New York Times took place in late 1992 so of course the big four bands from Seattle, including Nirvana, Pearl Jam, Alice in Chains, and Soundgarden, had huge selling albums at the time and were all over MTV and radio. Interviewing Jasper that morning was a reporter from the New York Times named Rick Marin, who was writing a story for the Style section about the so-called grunge movement and how it was becoming more mainstream. It was a story that had been reported previously to the point that it was all just really tired. To many in the city, the word grunge was a bad term. To them, it wasn't representative of what was going on in Seattle, and many of the musicians from the city associated grunge with the stuff you'd find in your kitchen sink, because in retrospect, there really was no Seattle sound. The bands that came out of the city didn't really sound that similar. Author Charles R. Cross, who used to be an editor for the local Seattle newspaper, The Rocket, would tell Ringer.com, it was an overhyped, inflated word that doesn't have actual meaning in Seattle. It's a time marker more than a description of music. And soon enough, Hollywood came knocking, making the 1992 film singles, focusing on the city's music scene, and even fashion designer Mark Jacobs started selling overpriced grunge wear. Upsetting a lot of people in Seattle was that the press couldn't even get basic facts about the city correct, often referring to Kurt Cobain's hometown of Aberdeen, Washington, as a suburb of Seattle, when in reality, it was more than 100 miles away. Marin would tell Jasper that he wanted to put together a list of slang terms people in Seattle used, but in reality, there was no slang that people in the city used. Jasper would tell the ringer.com, you react by trying to make fun of it. Now you guys may have heard this story before, but one part of the actual story that's been underreported is that the New York Times wasn't the first paper to ask for a list of slang words from Seattle. Prior to the Times piece being published, Sky Magazine from Britain spoke to Jasper 
and asked for a similar list. She would recall, I gave them a bunch of fake shit. And Sky Magazine would end up printing the words and the members of the band Mudhoney saw the list and started using the terms in an interview with another UK magazine, Melody Maker. But going back to Jasper's conversation with the New York Times in late 1992, former Sub Pop receptionist provided the paper with a much more exhaustive list of fake terms. Some were so ridiculous you would think the reporter would have caught on, but they didn't. Some of them included lame stain, which meant uncool person, rock on, which was a happy goodbye, swing in on the flippity flop, which meant hanging out, and cobnobbler, which meant loser. Jasper would tell the ringer, I thought if I said some stuff that sounded kind of believable and some stuff that sounded outrageous, that it would just lead us to laughing about it. And soon enough, Jasper heard typing on the other end of the phone, meaning the reporter was believing everything she said. Following the interview, Jasper would receive a call from her mother on November 15th, 1992, that she had made the New York Times. She would head to a local convenience store and buy the paper and open the style section and see a headline that read grunge, a success story. As part of the story, there was a column labeled the lexicon of grunge, breaking the code, featuring all the phony terms she had told the reporter over the phone. The article would state, all subcultures speaking code, grunge is no exception. Megan Jasper, a 25 year old sales clerk at Caroline Records in Seattle, provided this lexicon of grunge speak, coming to a high school or mall near you. She would tell the ringer, everyone in my family is a school teacher. For me to be in the New York Times because I effin' lied, you wouldn't think that they'd feel proud, but they were psyched. My family was so happy, they thought it was hilarious, she'd say. And soon enough, CZ Records, another local label in Seattle, started printing shirts featuring some of the words that appeared in the Times article. There were two different versions of the shirts with the lexicon of grunge printed on the back, with a different word printed on the front. One saying Harsh Realm and the other saying Lame Stain. But that wasn't the end of the story. A year after the article was published, it would be in the magazine The Baffler that exposed the fake terms. Thomas Frank, who worked for the magazine, talked to Jasper, who admitted she lied to the Times. In 1993, The Baffler published an article with the headline, Harsh Realm, Mr. Salzberger. The article would state, the Times went looking for some colorful Argo from the Seattle rock scene, and Miss Jasper was only too happy to oblige them with some of the most inspired fake slang outside of Monty Python. It would turn out that The Times got wind about the Baffler piece, and Marin and Styles editor Penelope Green got in touch with Jasper, who denied speaking to The Baffler. Jasper worried that Penelope Green could have been fired over the fiasco if she admitted to lying. She would tell the author Mark Yarm in the book Everybody Loves Our Town. Once the baffler got the word out, that created another shitstorm, which the New York Times caught wind of. So the editor of the style section called and yelled at me. She's like, it caused a lot of problems here and it's irresponsible of you to lie to our reporter. And then she asked me where she could buy the lame stain t-shirts from. She was obviously pissed off, but she wanted me to think that she was in on the joke. Art Chandry, who designed both concert posters and album covers in Seattle, would reveal in the book Grunge is Dead how the term soon started taking real meaning, revealing the more and more outsiders came here to partake of the explosion of the music scene. After a while, those words became real. You'd walk down the street and people were actually using the slang terms. And then years later, Harsh Realm becomes a TV show. Then you begin to realize the power of what happened. Here's this scene that didn't exist, that was created as a hype. That does it for today's video guys, thanks for watching, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe, we'll see you again on Rock and Roll Your Stories, take care.